as people are coming in, uh, we are excited. Um, again, as Natalie uh, Fotius, our um, our communications wizard, has put into the uh, put into the chat. Um, we want to know who's here, uh, so please uh, introduce yourself in the chat, uh, provide your name, and then one thing you're hoping to take away uh, from today's conversation. Um, and as the conversation flows and goes, if you have any other questions uh, or thoughts, please let's utilize the chat as best as possible. Um, we are currently being recorded, so this will also be available to those uh, who weren't able to make it, or if you just, you know, this is the best thing since sliced bread, you might want to watch it again. So, um, but with all good things, um, I, as I was sitting up last night and getting ready, um, I just wanted, there were a couple of quotes um, that jumped out at me that seemed appropriate in this conversation around leadership, and in particular around like African American leadership. Um, so there's a Sudanese proverb, a large chair does not make a king. Uh, and the way that I thought about that, just because you have the title of leader does not automatically make you a leader. Um, and then there's a Malawian proverb that I have that's been like core to my work as an organizer and collaborator in the city. Um, he who thinks he is leading um, and has no one following him is only out for a walk. Um, so we always have to be mindful in the space of leadership. It's not just talent. Uh, it's not just a title, but it's the ability to galvanize, um, connect, and really put forth a vision uh, that people can uh, can identify. Uh, but also when we think about African-Americans in leadership, uh, there's also like very real world um, um, systemic challenges and, 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 and things that hold people back from being able to attain leadership or really certain biases that really put the leader at a disadvantage as it relates to fundraising, um, as it relates to uh, recruitment of talent, um, things that I'm hopeful that we're able to get into today. So because not everybody knows everybody, I'm just going to do a quick run through of our um, guests um, for today's session. Um, so first, we have a lot, uh, Alondra Bolger. Um, she is with COAC. Um, she is a forward-thinking, creative, and servant leader with experience in nonprofit leadership, organizational development, project management, program design and implementation, and community and economic development. As the inaugural executive director of COAC, she's leading the development of a resource hub where Southeast Michigan's nonprofit and philanthropic community connect and access the knowledge, skills, and resources needed to collaborate, innovate, and amplify impact. Um, next, we have uh, Nicole Wilson. Uh, Nicole Wilson has served as the union's executive director since its inception and has more than 17 years of management experience and an additional eight years of programmatic experience working with at-risk youth and family. Uh, Mrs. Wilson is a registered nurse with a bachelor's degree from the University of Michigan Ann Arbor and a master's of business administration in healthcare management from the University of Phoenix. She is also a state certified HIV prevention test counselor and trainer. And last but never least, uh, we've got Sean Wilson, you know, after starting his career in the traditional nonprofit sector uh, with the YMCA at Metropolitan Milwaukee, Sean found his passion for social entrepreneurship and became a champion of innovative and scalable solutions to social issues. Sean's servant leadership style has been featured in the New York Times and during keynote speeches at MIT, Harvard, and the Clinton Global Initiative University. You know, from leading Usher's New Look Foundation to moving to the Ford Foundation, to currently serving as the president and CEO of the Boys and Girls Club of Southeast Michigan, Sean's perspective of being a black leader in the nonprofit space is deep and varied. And again, I just have to say, uh, it is an honor and a privilege to be in this space and to be able to facilitate this conversation. So I did that in, in, in record time. So we're gonna start off with our questions. All right, so uh, Alondra, and this will be for all three of our uh, panelists. Um, the ascension to leadership is a long and arduous one for many, uh, whether you are establishing a nonprofit or placed in a leadership role. What is the story behind your ascension to the leadership position you currently hold? Uh, through your story, if you could highlight one key lesson learned that you could share with the group um, that, you, uh, that you were able to gather, you know, through your journey. Uh, we'll start with Alondra, then go to Nicole, and then go to Sean. 
Terry, first and foremost, um, supreme gratitude for the opportunity to be here today uh, and not only be a part of this, this panel, but to just talk about uh, a subject matter that's so important uh, to our city and to our region. Uh, 20, 20 something years ago when I started my career in the nonprofit sector, I didn't know what nonprofit sector was, right? I went to school thinking I was gonna become a doctor. Um, quickly found out that's not what I wanted to do. But what carried through and what was, was really uh, important for me was to do work that led with service uh, and activism and that really allowed me to use my creativity to bring big ideas to bear, to collaborate with others, and to have big impact. Um, I started my career working in the child welfare uh, system in the juvenile justice system. And that work was super rewarding, right? But it was also really heartbreaking. Uh, and there were some things that I saw right out the gate, you know, as a 22 year old coming out of college. The first was that many of the folks who were in leadership positions and decision-making positions uh, didn't look like me, right? And the folks that we were serving looked like me. Uh, and so there was a gap in understanding what the needs were. And so you had folks working really hard, but we weren't seeing the type of outcomes that were really important for, you know, the folks that were our future, right? The second thing that I noticed was nonprofit organizations being on what I now know is the starvation cycle, right? So constantly chasing dollars. So I got really interested in understanding how I could move into a space where I could work with organizations to build their, what I now know is capacity, right? To be able to really serve my community. Um, I think the, and so now I have the opportunity, I have the privilege and the honor of serving as the first executive director for COAG Detroit. Uh, and I think the biggest takeaway for me and my leadership journey has been that I stand on the shoulder of giants, right? Um, my support network, my mentors have meant everything from speaking my name in rooms that I haven't been in to being able to help me reframe challenges as opportunities. And so I always point to that support from others uh, and, and those folks who have created a pathway for me to be able to walk. Thank you, Alondra, appreciate that. Uh, Nicole, same question. Well, well, first, dittoing Alondra, you know, Terry and to the Skillman Foundation, thank you for the opportunity for this conversation, um, much needed conversation. And so as um, Terry mentioned, you know, my, uh, my as in my trade, I am a registered nurse, right? So my journey was kind of similar to Alondra's in that I I found my way into the nonprofit sector. Um, my my journey is a little bit different in that you know my background was not initially in the human services per se. As a registered nurse, I was in healthcare, and so I always had the heart to help. Right. That's that's in my bones. My my daddy is a pastor and I came up, you know, he had a soup kitchen. And so I came up serving. Right. Um, and so when I went into college, I thought I was going to be a doctor, too. Um, and then I went into nursing. I got my master's degree and I thought I was going to go run somebody's, you know, hospital. Um, but um, my husband had this vision. Right. Of the union. He woke up at about five o'clock in the morning and said, God told me to start this thing called the union. I'm like, what does that mean? And um, it originally um, started as a record label. It was not a nonprofit. Um, and so he had an enlightenment, wanted to use his gifts in music to bring awareness, right, to the ills and, and negative messaging that youth were receiving. And so um, my purpose turned around. And um, it was used, uh, my gifts and my skill sets was used to uh, help him start this record label, which quickly formed into a nonprofit, um, right? And so, you know, one of the things that um, I learned as, as we were building this nonprofit from the ground up, it wasn't, you know, nothing was handed off. So, you know, we didn't we didn't, neither one of us was from the nonprofit sector. And so I had to quickly learn, my key lesson was to learn to know what I didn't know, right? Um, 
I learned that to be a good leader, I had to first be a good follower. I had to first um, be willing and, and humble enough to know what I did not know and to seek help and to seek support. And like Alondra said, standing on the shoulders of, of, of giants, right? And so to seek out support um, and wisdom and knowledge and resources from others that had been in the field um, before me. And so, um, and that has gained me um, just the world of help in, in setting up this organization and becoming an uh, effective leader um, in, within the black community, so. Awesome, thank you, Nicole. Um, Sean, I'm tossing the ball off the backboard so you can, you can clean it up. Yeah, let me let me go ahead and dunk real quick. Um, so, <laughs> so Terry, this is great. You know, we we have a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations, and so you know, it just feels like we just invited a couple hundred of our closest friends to kind of listen in. But you know, my my journey uh, in a lot of ways, I feel like I'm I'm full circle uh, right now, being at the Boys and Girls Clubs of Southeastern Michigan. You know, my my journey started in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, as a youth worker at 14 years old. Um, you know, I grew up in Milwaukee, which is literally the, the most challenging place to, to raise a black male in the country. I uh, grew up in similar situations as many of our youth. And, and honestly, I think this work and getting hooked into this work, you know, saved my life. It, it prevented me from going down similar paths that I saw a lot of my friends. And so, you know, starting off at a, as a youth worker, working my, uh, at the Children Outing Association, then moving over to the YMCA working up the ranks uh, of the YMCA uh, and really learning the, the nonprofit uh, business at every level. Uh, and then moving to Atlanta and really finding my passion as a social entrepreneur. And at a young age, you know, I look back and I laugh because I was like 25, 26, you know, helping, uh, you know, other social entrepreneurs start their own nonprofits, their own for-profit ventures with social impact. That was kind of bold at that point, you know, at 26 years old. But uh, I was able to work with a lot of NFL and NBA players. And the interesting thing about that is that it wasn't about the celebrity that appealed to me. The question I had in my mind was, you know, can you use what we call a fame currency, put it on top of an issue and move the needle? So can you put their fame currency on top of education or obesity or, or poverty or these different issues and, and help to move the needle. And so, you know, really did that for, for, uh, for a long time, had my own company helping uh, these individuals, probably my, you know, most well-known client was Usher. So I helped Usher start his organization uh, from the ground up, just celebrated 22 years uh, um, uh, this year. And, um, but, you know, after doing that for, for uh, over a decade plus, uh, decided I, I wanted to move on. And so I gave a year's notice and Jim Vela was uh, uh, on my board of directors, and, and that's actually how I ended up at Ford Fund and uh, in Detroit. And uh, it was really powerful uh, getting on the, the funding side. You know, you're able to, to see the, the dynamics uh, between the two. Uh, but after doing that for five years, you know, I saw an opportunity to, to really reimagine the Boys and Girls Club. And so that kind of leads me to the greatest thing I've learned, which is to chase impact, because on the surface, you know, my career looks like a zigzag, right? And you're like, wait, so YMCA, traditional nonprofit, you know, then you're professionalizing celebrity philanthropy, then you're going to, you know, Fortune 500 Ford, and now you're, you know, back to Boys and Girls Club, it, it feels like a zigzag. But honestly, what I've, I've done my whole life, which I think has really panned out well for me, is to chase impact. And the question I always would ask myself is, can I have a greater impact going where I'm going versus where I'm at? Right. Um, and 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 I think if you do that, you know, it, it may not look like a straight line, but at the end of the day, I can honestly say that all of my experiences in the past have kind of converged on this moment with the Boys and Girls Club and allowed us to really reimagine this organization uh, for greater community impact. Uh, thank you, sir. And th thanks to all three of you. Um, I'm very much like in terms of how kind of reframing and, and, and shaping that like standing on the shoulders of giants, like being being aware that none of us got to the spaces that we're in alone. Um, and how are we leveraging our networks and our infra and our and our relationships to help move work forward? You know, the ability to adapt and adjust and overcome. You know, we might have one path, we might have one um, thought, but then being open to the adaptation that life tends to throw at us from time to time. And then being focused on impact, because if, if it's not about making a difference, 
Uh, just thinking about, you know, the work we do with young people, we might as well just toss a ball into a gym and just say, you know, that's good enough. And I think to a person, everybody here knows that good enough is not good enough for, you know, for our young people and for our city. Um, all right, Alondra, um, coming back to you. Um, from your seat as a leader of COAC, you know, an organization committed to accelerating collaborative action in Southeast Michigan's nonprofit community, um, would you be so kind to speak to us about uh, what that acceleration process looks like in practice? Um, if you could speak to some of the strengths that you've been able to identify that exist within our nonprofit space, especially those that are led by African Americans, and really some of the challenges that uh, that those same leaders are facing as well. Um, and if I might just add a little tweet, a little tweet, um, thinking about it from the pre-pandemic to this new reality that we're in, how have those strengths and how have those challenges, um, you know, kind of exacerbated itself at this time? Yeah, um, that's a mouthful, Terry. <laughs> um, you know, at Coact, <clears throat> everything we do, we do in collaboration with others. I like to, I like to think about it as partnerships in action, right? And if you unpack collaboration, uh, it's more than just working together, right? Like it's it's building deep and authentic relationships. And I think that's that's uber important, right? The other thing is if we want to see the type of transformation that I think all of us on this on this panel and in this session are talking about in our communities, then you gotta get to the understanding of what the, the systemic barriers are, right? And so for us, our work is undergirded. Um, I got to call out my partners, Michigan Nonprofit Association, Michigan Community Resources, new uh, in the U of M School of Social Work, because a few years ago, they came together uh, and did uh, authored a report that engaged the nonprofit community called Building a Network, right? And that report undergirds everything that we do at COAC. It's how we design our programs. It's how we think about our work. And what it does is it takes a holistic approach to capacity building and collaboration. And the idea is that one part, you're working with nonprofits who are already resourceful and innovative, right, um, to build the capacity in areas that, that may be needed so that they can move their missions forward. But more so than that, strengthening a network, right, of all of us, because in order for us to move, you know, have big solutions for big problems, it takes all of us. And so it's also undergirded by, by looking through the lens of racial justice and racial equity, right? And so for us, when we think about some of the challenges that nonprofits are facing, in particular those led by BIPOC leaders, we know that institutional racism is embedded in the nonprofit sector. We know that significant race gap exists when it comes to senior leadership positions as well as on boards. Um, how do we get to the heart of that? How do we start to address the funding gaps and the access that, that BIPOC leaders um, and BIPOC-led organizations have? Um, for us, we do a few things. Um, I'm sitting in our space today, which has been closed since the pandemic, and I'm really looking forward to bringing it back online this fall because part of what our work is about is bringing folks from those disparate parts, right, of philanthropy, government, and the nonprofit space together so that we can have those natural collisions, that we can have those conversations, that we can start to understand each other. Um, for us, that shows up in dialogue. It shows up in our programming and ensuring that nonprofit leaders have access to the resources, tools, and information that they need to move their missions forward. So a many of those problems existed before the pandemic. The pandemic exacerbated those issues, right? And I think as you look at the pandemic and you look at kind of the heightened awareness around uh, racial injustice in our society, you saw a lot of donations and a lot of grants being made to BIPOC-led organizations as disaster relief. Many of those organizations a year later are finding themselves in the exact same position that they were in prior to the pandemic. So for us, the, the, I, I would call out um, probably the biggest program that we've done to address this has been our Activate Fund. And the Activate Fund is really a microcosm of what we would like to see in the broader nonprofit ecosystem, which is a more connected and resilient ecosystem that is centering leaders of color. Um, we were able to provide about $1.5 million in grants to nonprofit organizations uh, for capacity building needs to support their collaborative efforts to think about more sustainable funding opportunities and to connect them with subject matter experts to move that work forward. 
And for us, we really kind of, we really focused on leaders of color. Um, almost 70% of the folks that received funding from us were leaders of color. So, you know, there, we, we go at this by addressing the systemic barriers and removing those barriers to the access and to um, the tools to move that work forward. This is about culture shift. And this is about pushing against the status quo and recognizing like abundance does exist for us, it's here, but it's a matter of being able to connect to it and have access to it. I appreciate that. It is about mindset. And if you look from a mindset of abundance um, and you work from a space of like, how are you pushing the status quo that that we're in this um, space of lack? Um, how things can shift and, and for you and for the better. Um, Sean, uh, you refer to yourself as a recovering program officer, uh, which always <laughs> causes me to giggle. Um, and because of that experience, um, could you speak to the either or tension that exists in philanthropy of, you know what, we fund programs and we don't fund capacity building or those that just fund capacity building without an eye on the programs that the, that the capacity being built helps to enable. Um, what are we um, as um, the, within the philanthropic community uh, missing about that dynamic? Um, and from your perspective, where should philanthropy have a stronger role in leadership development, um, especially for BIPOC organizations and specifically for black led orgs? All right, that's a mouthful. Um, so, so yeah, a couple, a couple things, you know, um, having sat on both sides, there, there is a real tension, right? Uh, but I also look at it from a lens of a social entrepreneur. So I'm an entrepreneur, I'm an investor, uh, personally, you know, I invest in startups, uh, that have a social impact lens, you know, so I'll sit on the boards, uh, as part of our investment. And the thing I always think about is how different it, it is when I was, uh, how different how big of a difference it was when I was an investor as a, uh, you know, philanthropic leader on the on the grant making side, and then how my mind works as an investor in a for profit or non profit social impact fund, right, or uh, organization. And what I mean by that is that you know you have to trust leadership. So part, you know, when we're vetting a deal, we look at the leadership and so you know we say, do we trust Terry to implement this vision to get to the end of the. Uh, you know, to, to, to the end game, right? Do we trust Terry? Is he a strong leader? Does he possess the skills to get us there? Does he have a strong vision? Am I comfortable that Terry can implement that vision successfully? Um, but it's very rare, and I've never done it as an investor to say, hey, Terry, I'm going to give you this X amount of dollars, but you can only spend it on this. You cannot spend it on staff. You can't spend it on over, you know, on, on your facilities. You can't spend it on that, right? And because at the end of the day, we have to trust Terry and Terry to get it done and understanding that a startup, that a business by its very nature moves, right? And so we have to empower Terry with the resources to, to get it done versus on the philanthropic side, a lot of times it was like, hey, I can't fund that. I understand that's your greatest need, um, but I can't fund that. That's not in the scope of what Ford Fund uh, funds, right? And so, so then I think it creates a whole slew of problems because then you people, you know, you have people kind of closing one eye to make it fit. They're chasing uh, the dollars and it really throws them off of their, their mission. And so, you know, part of what I would challenge the funding community to do is to, to ask themselves, why are we restricting dollars, right? Are we restricting dollars because that's the best way that, that we feel we can get to our mission alignment? And if that's the case, fair. Or are we restricting dollars because we don't have faith or trust in the leadership in the nonprofit community to be able to get the job done? And if that's the reason, then there's a bigger issue there, right? There, there's something else that you need to address, which kind of goes to your second point of, you know, how, how do we develop the right leaders um, in the space and kind of what's the role? And, you know, that, that leads to, I, I think a lot of times, once again, you know, we like to fund very passionate leaders in nonprofit, and that's powerful. But we also have to fund leaders with a business acumen. And I know I'm going to get a lot of uh, angry emails because when you start talking business and nonprofit, you know, pe people get upset and they don't feel like you're authentic. But I, I really do feel that that's important because by running your nonprofit well, the youth benefit in our case. Right. If, if we're running our organization, well, it's the youth, it's the community that benefits. And so, you know, I think we have to get leaders um, with diverse backgrounds, with with 
you know, backgrounds in growing organizations with uh, managing staff with all those. I'm not saying we don't have that right now in the space. I'm just saying that's that's important because, it, you know, it, the first part and the second part goes hand in hand. You know, we have to feel comfortable. And as a leader coming back um, on the nonprofit side, on the operating side from being with Ford, my mindset is totally shifted. Whereas I believe we fundraise through vision and inspiration. So we'll sit with you, we'll present the vision, the inspiration, the operational readiness to tackle this. And if you wanna invest, great. And if you don't wanna invest, I understand that because it just may not be right for you, but there has to be this confidence level uh, to be able to do that. But that's only because I've, I've seen in both sides of the window, right? I've seen in, in, in both windows. So, so long story short, I think, you know, we have to challenge ourselves as funders, you know, to, to make sure that we're providing the resources that the organizations need to really scale the work that they're doing, remove as, as many of the, the barriers to success as, as possible, right? Take the restrictions off um, and, then, and then demand excellence from those leaders. So if, if you're gonna give them flexibility in how they spend the dollars, then you have to demand results and you have to demand a certain uh, level of excellence. So you can't, you can't have it both ways, right? You can't, you can't get the unrestricted dollars without having the, the you know, full responsibilities on the back end of if things don't go right, you have to own that, right? So, um, so th those are some of my thoughts. Thank you, Sean. Um, there, there's, a, there's, a, a, a one, there's this idea, this concept called trust-based philanthropy where it really gets at the heart of what you're saying. Like you build that trust into the leader and you give them the resources that they need to make the decisions and to move the vision that they have imparted to you that you got so excited about in the first place. So, you know, how do we, how do those in philanthropy do a better job of, of really moving on that level of trust that those organizations that we see something in that is really based on the leadership and how do you then invest in that leader? Uh, thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Um, just a quick note to the to everybody like this is a a, a one you know a, a small group conversation right now that you you know everybody's uh, kind of fishbowling but we will transition into small groups to really help us digest uh, what we heard um, provide our own feedback and our own experiences so you'll be talking to others soon um so we just wanted to get that out there uh, hey nicole um I got to, again, as I think to be consistent with the other two, uh, our other two friends, this will be a mouthful. Uh, so, to, you know, answer that as you will. Um, in this moment uh, where this country is wrestling uh, with so many, you know, issues around social justice, you know, a lot tied to gender, tied to race, um, you are smack dab in the middle being a, a, a black female. So when you think about your role, you know, as a founding leader, of uh, the union, what challenges have you faced, uh, are you facing, um, and continue to face as the leader of a nationally recognized youth serving nonprofit? Um, we've talked about this before. Many times in Detroit, we think that we have to look outside for the answer to what we already know is working inside the city and aren't willing to give the funds or the resources to those that can make national models um, out of what's happening in the city. So. All that is to say is, what are people not seeing about the struggle of being a black female in philanthropy right now? And then, again, mouthful, in the fall of 2020, uh, uh, whoo, BDAD, the Black Nonprofit Executive Director Alliance of Detroit uh, was formed. Um, if you think about your journey of all of that and you juxtapose it with what is happening with BDAD, um, I'm very much interested in how you would respond to that question. Yes, third time, a mouthful. <laughs> um, you know, it's layered for me as a woman, as a black woman that leads, right? And so just in, the, in those two aspects, as a woman and as a black woman, um, that's layered in itself because we, as women, we have to balance. We balance being mothers, we balance being wives, we balance being daughters, we balance being sisters, right? And then we balance being leaders. Um, and so you're juggling these things, that's one layer. Um, and then what gets added on to that is this pressure to be better, 
right? You, you need to be better than your male counterparts. You, parts. you need to be better than your um, white counterparts, right? Um, in uh, proving yourself as a, a, a black leader, as a black female leader um, in the nonprofit sector. And, it, and it's, it's, it's systematic, right? Um, because on top of all of that, then there is this kind of program systematic um, messaging that as a black person, we get that we're insufficient. We're, we're not enough. We're not smart enough. We're not, you know, um, progressive enough. We're not innovative enough. Um, we, we don't have the resources, right, to pull this off. And so we have to overcome that. Um, I've had to overcome that. Um, you know, I've been in places on stages um, with my husband even. Now, my husband, he is my biggest cheerleader. He uh, will tell anybody, you know, uh, about the work that I've done. He will uplift the work that I've done at our nonprofit. But my husband is the founder. He's the, the CEO. Um, and I, but I've been on stages with him where um, the recognition will go to him right, for the work that I've done. Now, he will automatically correct that. But it's kind of this assumption, right, that um, well, he's the man, right? He, he did that. Um, and, 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 and so it's that framework from the, the gender piece. Um, but it's also the framework from, you know, what you spoke to, Terry. Um, the, the Bible says a, a prophet is without honor in his own home. And so we've also been in stages and on stages and in places where opportunities were presented to us um, because of our experience and the work that we've done in the community, right? Almost two decades in of doing this work. Um, but when we're at the table, um, other organizations are uplifted that aren't even in the city of Detroit, right? That, um, and so it's like, lift up the work that's being done here. Lift up the work for the leaders that are on the, the ground and that have proven themselves faithful in servicing the community. Um, and so that kind of links in BDAD um, because that in a sense is the, the root of the vision that um, Anise Hayes, who's the executive director of Atlantic Impact, had for Be Dead. It stemmed from a vision of uplifting and supporting leadership of Black executive directors who serve um, communities in the city of Detroit. Um, and so we know that, you know, Black nonprofits, they tend to be disproportionately underfunded. Um, data shows that, you know, annual foundation giving focused on reaching people of color is at about 17% of all funds given. Nearly 60% of Black-led organizations, they function at $500,000 operating budgets, and they have about 25% of their budget um, is, is, you know, operating reserves is less than 25%. Right. So there's an under investment here, you know, that that's very evident. Um, BDAD wanted to address that need. Um, it wanted to address that inequity by recognizing it and building um, um, advocacy around the need for for additional funding sources and, and staff development and facilities and programming expenses being supported for Black-led organizations, particularly for those that serve um, the city of Detroit. And so, um, you know, we're really, uh, right now BDAD has nine founding members. Um, and so we're hoping that by May of 2022, that work will be expanded. Um, that we will expand the membership. We have consultants working with us to build up that framework, um, to expand our efforts and to expand the membership that can benefit from those efforts. And so, um, you know, we're really trying to push the needle 
on, on what Alondra was speaking to, on what Sean was speaking to as it relates to equity um, and building up those partnerships with stakeholders and partners to, um, to invest. Right, invest in the talent, invest in the skill set, invest in the potential of black led organizations. Yes, awesome. Thank you, Nicole. Um, all right, so we're going to, I've got this one last question, and it is not a mouthful. Uh, and then we're going to dig into small groups. Uh, but at, at putting on my like community organizer hat, um, if, you know, closed mouths don't get fed. Uh, so I just wanted to give you guys the opportunity to say, you know, to, to, we've got funders in the group, we've got other um, elected officials, we've got leaders in our community uh, that are represented uh, of those that are on this call right now. Um, so when you think about it, like, what is your ask? As a, as a Black nonprofit leader in the city of Detroit, what is your ask? Uh, or what is the closing thought that you would like to leave with those um, that as they, when they depart from this call, um, is ringing in their ear around how they need to shift, how they need to change, and how we as a collective can show up differently for um, this segment of our nonprofit community. Um, let's start with Al yep, Alondra, and then we'll go Nicole, and then Sean can close out. Uh, just really quickly, for the sake of time, I'll try to, because I could, I could take the rest of this time to, 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 <laughs> to stand on this soapbox. Uh, the folks closest to the problem are usually closest to the solution there is ingenuity and brilliance and so many other things that black leaders are bringing to the table. Uh, it's the lack of resources that become a big issue. And I think that the lack of resources has been a precursor for much of the innovation that we see in our communities. So my mind immediately goes to, if the resources are available, my God, what would the impact be? The second thing that I just want to point to that's coming down the pipeline uh, is one of the first efforts, if not the first effort in the country, uh, is a survey and report that is being led by the Knight Foundation, the folks at Data Driven Detroit, uh, Johnson Center, and the Michigan Nonprofit Association. We've had an opportunity to be a part of that, that is tracking leadership demographics uh, around BIPOC leaders. So I feel like beyond like the conversation, this is real data that will demonstrate funding relationships for black led organizations that will start to really point to on a local level, the disparities that exist around funding um, between white led and black led organizations uh, and what the leadership actually looks like in some of these organizations. Um, yeah, I, I would add to that and it's really piggybacking on, on what Sean discussed as it related to relationships between um, Black-led nonprofits and uh, stakeholders and funders. Um, my ask would be to, you know, build a model of support for Black-led organizations, not with, you know, a single lens focus on deliverables and outcomes, um, but with a trust framework. And we all, you know, people are just people. We're, we're all humans, right? And you cannot build trust without building a relationship, right? That, that, that doesn't happen. And so my ask is to come in, you know, come in, um, get down to the nitty gritty with us of what's going on in our organization, what's going on in our communities. Build the relationship of trust um, so that um, there we can, we can make progress against leaders of color's perception, right? That funders don't feel comfortable giving money to us, that they feel more comfortable giving monies to white-led organizations. Um, to uh, dispel that, you know, funders don't feel comfortable giving money to us because they distrust us, because they think we're poor fiscal managers, right? Um, and so, um, but that can't happen because sometimes there are innate, um, there, there, there's redlining, 
right, um, in the nonprofit sector. And um, it's just kind of innate in us as it relates to what our perceptions are about other people's capacities and abilities. Um, and, and we want to move past that. So, so come in, build the relationship of trust, get down in the nitty gritty of it. Um, I read an article and it had a quote in it that was just uh, amazing to me. It said, funders seem to want transformational investment and results from Black-led black organizations, but are only willing to give transactional dollars to the athlete. We want to push past that, you know, um, and, and build a trusting relationship, invest in the leaders, um, and invest in the organizations so that we can invest in our communities and help our people. Great. So I, uh, just three quick ones. Uh, one, I would love to see, you know, everybody on, on this uh, Zoom um, to focus on what we believe the root cause of all these issues that everyone's trying to address. The root cause is poverty, you know, and that's one of the things Boys and Girls Club pivoted to was really focusing on um, building a ladder, an economic mobility ladder that allow our youth to become career startup and homeowner ready. Because as someone who's been doing this work for you know 25 years, you know I've I've focused on getting kids to graduate on time. I focused on disrupting the prison pipeline. Focused on gun violence, like you name it. But but after all that time, what I've come to realize is the root cause is poverty, 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 poverty. And so if collectively we all look at what we're doing and we say, what what is what role are we playing? Um, you know, towards reducing poverty, to, to pulling youth up that economic and adults and families and communities up that economic mobility ladder. So that would be one piece because I think then we'll start to see the, the needle move collectively. The second piece would be to recognize that there, there is true bias, right? And there's a need uh, in, in funding, right? And there's a need for representation uh, at the staff level, the board level, uh, all of those things. And those go hand in hand, lack of rep representation and bias go hand in hand. I'll give you a quick story. When I was at Ford Fund, um, I really wanted to, and I did fund uh, Shaka Senghor. So Shaka Senghor is from Detroit, um, killed a man, did 20, 25 years in prison. But since coming out, he really redeemed himself. He uh, you know, made amends with the family. He became a New York Times bestselling author. Oprah, you know, called him one of the, the best interviews she's ever done. I mean, I could go on and on and on. But when I was at Ford, I really wanted to fund him. And as I talked to other funders, you know, there was just this, this hesitancy. But what I knew as a black male is that you can't tell the black male story. You can't help, help black males without addressing some ugly truths. And especially around the role that the incarceration and prison system has has paid or uh, played in in um, in the decline of, of black males and, and black communities, right? So long story short, I, I you know basically sent dollars through another nonprofit to support him because I knew you know I knew it wouldn't be a, a popular decision, but we have to embrace those things, right? And I have one funder uh, who was a white female who said my board would lose it if I funded him. Right. And so we can't be afraid to have those bold conversations to say, no, but this is important what he's doing. Um, and this is going to have greater impact than the than the pretty photo op. Right. That that we like, like sometimes we have to fund those things. And I'll just say this, Terry, when I went to the reception um, for the work that Shaka was doing, the only other funder I saw there uh, was Tanya Allen from Skillman. And so, you know, so that I gained a lot of respect for her and a lot of respect for for Skillman that day. So once again, economic mobility, there is bias, we have to address it, and we have to create better representation at the senior leadership and the board levels. Awesome. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. And thanks to the, to, to, to you, Nicole, Alondra, like your voice, um, your message. Uh, I learned something about each of you, and I consider myself, you know, pretty, you know, all of us, you know, pretty good friends, colleagues in this work. Uh, and I really gained a lot from you and learning about your your journeys, your struggles, uh, and really your view on this world. The one thing I would acknowledge is that what we've heard goes across service types. So whether or not um, you're a youth serving organization, you're a workforce organization, you're in philanthropy, you're in city, um, our ability uh, in a majority black city 
uh, to really cut across the systemic challenges or systemic barriers that keep us from seeing sometimes the positive in, in people, uh, we really have to confront that um, because we're losing out on, on, on talent. We're losing out on opportunities to really, um, from the ground, be able to enable systemic and real change in the city of Detroit and in Metro Detroit across. Um, so right now, uh, we are going to um, move into small groups. Uh, and I'm going to actually shut up and say, Natalie, what, what's going to happen next? OK, well, you will see a prompt on your screen. We're going to break out into really small, intimate conversations of about four to five people in each room. We'll be there for almost about 10 minutes and um, a prompt will appear for you. But really, we want people to share what is your ask of funders. You may have a funder in your room, um, but this session is being recorded and we will share it um, again with funders. And uh, I think Terry's got his uh, sights on writing up a blog too about what we've heard today um, so we can help share the insights that all of you have. So without further ado, here we go. So uh, I really do appreciate, I hope, I know it's never enough um, time uh, hopefully, we were just able to get some initial thoughts, initial feelings out there. Um, and I'm thankful uh, to everybody for engaging in that conversation. Uh, again, we'd like to thank our three panelists, uh, Nicole, Sean, Alondra. <clears throat> thank you so very much. Appreciate your wisdom. Appreciate your insight. And, and as always, just appreciate all that you do um, for young people, nonprofit leaders, just doing it for the city of Detroit. Like, thank you. Um, Great shout out, tremendous shout out to Natalie and Mark, our communications department at the Skillman Foundation for enabling this event to happen. Um, they are the, the, this is the brain, this is their brainchild and they are really supporting us as program officers uh, to bring life to this work. Um, we'd like to invite you all to our next event. On Tuesday, June 29th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., the Skillman Foundation is offering an implicit bias workshop. It is invite only, uh, but we'd like to extend that invitation to all of you. Um, our staff recently went through this training and we got a lot out of it. Um, and so it's going to be facilitated by um, the good Reverend Dr. Brian T. Mark Sr., uh, Chief Equity Officer um, at the National Training Institute on Race and Equity. Um, through the training, you will learn how implicit bias works, its causes and consequences, and how it can be managed at the individual and organizational level. RSVP by clicking on the link in the chat. Please only RSVP if you think you can attend because space is limited. We are at time, uh, but we are never, we are always building and growing. And we as a foundation are tremendously appreciative of everything that you do uh, because together uh, we can make it happen. So thank you again. Um, enjoy the sunshine and make it a great day. <laughs>